on a uh, on a small future project that not a lot of people have heard about called the Electron Ion Collider. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Hi, okay. Small is a slight uh, underestimation. I think and, it's... <laughs> and, and, and it seems that nobody talks about anything else nowadays, but... Uh, That's okay. good, so, because <laughs> it is the biggest project which we are doing. So I guess you hear me well and yeah. you see my slides well. Okay. Perfect. So, perfect. Go ahead. Thanks, Alka. Okay. Perfect. So it's a pleasure for me to introduce you to the Electron Ion Collider. I will tell you what it is so that you know why everybody is talking about it and why it is a perfect collider actually to unravel the mysteries of uh, visible matter. So what is the EIC? So the EIC is a high luminosity, luminosities between 10 to 33 to 34 polarized electron ion collider with a wide range of center of mass energies between 20 uh, GV to 140. Um, we have uh, the full collider included in the project and one interaction region, and we have the possibility to build a second detector. Um, the uh, machine is actually built on uh, the uh, RIG facility. So what we are doing is we take the Hadron facility of RIG and upgrade it ma uh, majorly and then add an electron machine. So the Hadron machines then can produce beams between uh, with 40 and 100 to 275 GV uh, for protons and up to 110 GV for every heavy ion you can think of. We will run with very high beam currents. Um, we will increase the number of bunches from RIG from 120 to 1160 and then run with a very small bunch spacing, much smaller than the LHC. We will have polarized beams, protons, deuterium, and hel helium-3, the nuclear beams, and we will actually also include a completely new concept, so that is a large development also in accelerator science, uh, actually for cooling hadron beams. For the electrons, uh, we will have energies between 5 and 18 GV, um, very high current, same number of bunches, of course. Your electrons will be fully polarized. And again, um, if you are not, uh, if you are doing research in collider physics, we are actually also pushing there. We develop a very new injector to the electrons uh, storage ring, which is a rapid cycling synchrotron to actually get the polarized uh, electrons from the source into the machine. And then we have a high luminosity interaction region, which runs with a crossing angle, which is the first machine which actually really use, utilizes a large crossing angle and as such also uh, grab cavities to rotate the bunch back to have a head-on collision. The luminosity over the center of mass energy you can see here, so actually uh, very high and more or less flat for a wide range in the center of mass energy is close to 10 to the 34. So the physics case, that is what you are interested in. I give you a small summary and then I give you examples for the individual cases. So we really want to understand what is uh, the secrets of hadrons. And for that, we first of all want to understand where does their spin and the mass comes from. But we also would like not to uh, look to this in one dimensions. We really want to take three dimensional pictures and I will show you this of how the uh, quarks and gluons are actually really distributed in space and in momentum. So what is their transverse momentum inside the proton and how actually then all of this drives the nucleon properties and their interactions of the quarks and the gluons inside the nucleons. Then we take our protons and neutrons and put them inside a nucleus and then look again how then uh, what we have learned on the proton is actually modified if a proton sits in a nucleus. So, and also how the nuclear uh, binding actually is uh, governed by the quarks and the gluons. And last and but not least, if we have the nuclei, we can actually really create very, very dense uh, uh, gluon um, densities. And then can look that we see a regime where the gluons don't uh, emit gluons, but because there are so many in a very small space that they actually start to recombine what is generally referred to by nonlinear QCD interactions or by saturation regime. And that is something which is see as a big topic for the EIC. So what is the process which we are looking, uh, what we are using there? So what we are doing is we have an electron which emits a virtual photon and then this photon interacts with the patterns inside the uh, proton or in the nucleus. 
And uh, I have here a nice interaction. So you see this, you have the virtual photon, and then you kind of resolve what is in there. This is actually very nice because if you have an electron you and, and such deep inelastic scattering, you really kind of have a, a pointless a point like probe. And so you kind of are not uh, like with, if you have proton proton scattering, you have already a complex probe and want to study another complex probe. The other advantage is that uh, with DIS, you can really on event basis uh, determine what the uh, momentum and uh, and uh, uh, angle and so on of the quarks inside the proton is. The reaction is governed actually by this variables here. So Q square, which is basically one over the wavelengths of the virtual photon gives you the real solution power. X, you have learned for sure already during your uh, school is a momentum fraction of the quark inside the proton and Y gives the inelasticity. And then you have the center of mass energy and then you can actually combine all of them. So that we want actually a wide range in center of mass energy is because if you change your center of mass energy, then the proton itself actually reveals itself very differently. At low center of mass energy, the proton basically looks like the uh, three valence quarks with some gluons. And if you then increase it, you actually see a proton which is dominated purely by gluons. So how uh, does this look like what the EIC can cover in the XQ square plane? And that is something you can see here. So the EIC basically can go up to an X of one and then down to an X of 10 to the minus four over a very large range of Q square. And if you uh, want to go to low uh, X, you need to increase your center of mass energy. So again, that's why we need variable center of mass energy. And if you want to increase uh, your Q square, then you need actually higher luminosity. And that also means normally higher center of mass energy. And the gluons actually are predominantly living at low X and uh, low Q square. So how do you access actually in DIS uh, uh, partons of quarks and gluons? So you have several processes. You can uh, look actually to inclusive uh, scattering DIS, so where you looked only to the scattered lepton. Then you can kind of combine this by looking to different flavored hadrons, which then through the fragmentation function allow you to determine on what flavored quark you have been scattering. You can use charge current, which means that instead of exchanging a virtual photon, you exchange a W. That has a huge advantage because of how the, uh, the charge current interaction, the electroweak uh, works. You have uh, direct access to the flavor of the quark without using fragmentation functions. And that actually is a really nice complementarity process uh, to, uh, to test actually semi-inclusive DIS approaches with uh, charge current. And then, of course, something you have for sure learned a lot about uh, chats that are the best observable really to access the pattern kinematics by because they represent uh, really nicely uh, how the pattern energy, the angle, and all its uh, properties. So if I want to actually look to gluons in uh, DIS, then I have to do a little bit more work because DIS, as it exchanges mainly an electromagnetic uh, probe uh, that uh, doesn't interact directly with gluons. Nevertheless, DIS is actually the nicest process to study gluons. So how do you do this? So if you have the uh, cross-section for DIS, which I write it down here, then you have actually, it is uh, kind of represented by two structure functions, F2 and FL, where F2 gives you the quark and antiquark uh, momentum distribution in the proton, and FL is directly sensitive uh, to the gluons. So if gluons would not exist, then actually what was predicted is that if I measure the cross-section, which I show here, that it depends only on X and has no dependence on Q squared. So F2 would be just a flat distribution as function of X, and that was known as uh, Björken scaling. So what I show you here in this plot is actually exactly this cross-section for as function of Q squared and then for different kind of X. And what you see immediately is that at high X, indeed, the cross-section is completely flat uh, versus Q square. But then at, uh, if I go to lower and lower X, it starts to be rising. And so that is actually a direct observation 
uh, of uh, the gluons where uh, you have a gluon splitting in uh, and emitting another gluon or gluon splitting in QQ bar pairs. And that actually is then called and is known since Hera has made this measurement under the scaling violation. And what is, oops, what is very nice is actually that you can get the gluon distribution inside the proton by basically looking to the derivative of the cross-section which you measure with function of Q square. So you can also use some other processes, not only the Q square dependence of the cross section, you can measure FL, where you need to vary your energy in your uh, collider, because the Y goes with different energies. And if you want to have a direct access, you need to make a Y uh, large, so you uh, said you get FL. You can take actually the process of photon gluon fusion, which I show here. So you have your virtual photon, you have the gluon, and then you get a QQ bar pair. For that, ideal is to look to die jets or to charm production. And if you want to measure all of them, you need, of course, a wide coverage in X and Q squared in your detector. So if we now look to how the pattern distribution functions look like, and that is uh, some of the latest uh, from, from Hera. So here, a linear, um, and not an exponential or suppressed uh, picture, so versus X and the high X region. And there you see that you have your valence, U quark, your D quark, and then immediately, already at an X of 0.3, you see the, uh, the, the gluons and the C quarks are actually really dominating the proton. And here you have this versus a, a larger region of uh, X and uh, the gluon and the C are multiplied by a, a, by a factor to bring them on the same, that you can plot them on the same scale. And again, you see at uh, low X, everything is basically gluons, which you see inside the proton. So I told you earlier that spin is one of the quantities which we really want to study. And spin is actually a real fundamental property of matter. All elementary particles have spin, but the Higgs, and it's not, it cannot be explained by a static picture. It's so it's much more than just the sum over the quark and the gluon spins. It also involves orbital angular momentum. And so if you really want to kind of disentangle all of them, you have to really uh, be sensitive to measure the glue, quark spin, the gluon spin, and the angular momentum. The EIC can do that very well because I told you we will have polarized beams. And by doing so, it allows us to measure cross-section difference where the electron spin and the proton spin are aligned, uh, minus when they are anti-aligned. And if you then want to get access to the uh, quark distributions, then you take the integral over this uh, 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 over this cross-section difference. Or if you want to get the gluons, then you do exactly the same approach as for the uh, unpolarized one, you take the derivative of this uh, cross-section difference to get the gluon, uh, the polarized gluon distribution. So here I show you what we know about this cross-section difference, which we named G1. So here at the high X, it is known from the current experiments, but as soon as we go to lower X, the different lines actually represent the uncertainty which we have on this. And then here I overlay uh, the uh, the points from uh, from an EIC measurement, and you see actually that you see no uncertainties, and that is because we have this really large uh, luminosity, so we will be only dominated by systematics, and you can see by this statistics, we can nicely pick what uh, actually the distribution uh, will look like for this uh, cross-section difference. Now we do this, of course, not only for one X and Q square point, we do this exactly like in the unpolarized case for Hera as function of Q square and for many X. And then if we convert this into what is the sum of the contribution of quarks and gluons versus the orbital angular momentum, you get this uncertainty profiles here. And with the full EIC and all the data from the full uh, energy range, then you actually come to a, an uncertainty of the quark gluon and orbital angular distribution of the dark blue. And depending on whether you have orbital angular momentum, this ellipse is kind of uh, moving around uh, cis lines here in this phase space. So we have spin, we have the unpolarized PDF. I told you also, we want to really understand how the quarks are distributed in a spatial distribution. So are they sitting at the edge of the proton in the center? And what is their transverse momentum? 
We can combine all of this in what is called a Wigner function, and you can basically think about this like a QCD genetic map of the proton because it absolutely reveals everything. But that is, of course, a very high level goal. Um, we can start a little bit easier. We integrate out uh, the spatial distribution and look only to the momentum distribution longitudinal and transverse. And then we can actually do measurements which give us this kind of pictures, how, for example, an up quark, the transverse momentum distribution changes by going to lower and lower x. And you see that it becomes wider in the model which we have been using to generate these pictures. And the same you can do for your uh, distributions in coordinate space. You basically integrate over the transverse momentum distribution, and then you can look whether how it works, and here it is a down quark, whether say you're sitting at high x in the center of the proton, and then if you go to lower and lower x, the uh, kind of distribution takes more and more space inside the proton and fills basically the proton, and they move to the rim. So we can do very exact measurements of this by uh, looking to a process which is called deeply virtual Compton scattering, where you have a virtual photon interacting with a quark and emitting a, a real photon. And what is actually very interesting because it is an exclusive reaction, the proton stays intact and you have only a momentum transfer to the proton. Here you see how precisely we can actually measure the cross-section as function of this momentum transfer to the proton. And then because the momentum transfer and the spatial distribution are Fourier transforms, that is exactly what we are doing. We Fourier transform the cross-section, and then we get the spatial distribution of here the quarks inside the proton. We can do this as, as function of x for a fixed q square, as a fixed x as versus q square, and you get this really nice distributions. And then you can really map out where the quarks are sitting depending on where you are in your kinematic uh, plane. Now you take this all together, you reconstruct this uh, quark, uh, this uh, generalized pattern distributions, and then you can kind of really see that at the valence quarks are at high, quark, uh, high x, are sitting at the center, so they have a small spatial distribution. The C quarks are kind of sitting more at the periphery. And the question, of course, is what are the gluons doing? And we can do exactly the same for the gluons by exchanging, not looking to a virtual photon in the final state, but a shape psi, because that can be only produced through the photogluon fusion process. And then again, you get this really nice images of the spatial distribution of the gluons inside the proton. And you can do this again here as function of x for a fixed uh, q square. So now you can say from all what you have learned, why do I care? Actually, that is really important to also understand other measurements. You know, they have been seen in uh, PP, PLET, and PP collisions, this uh, kind of riches. There are very nice theories which kind of try to describe actually where they are coming from, and particularly in the lower uh, systems like PLET. And one of the big hurdles is that the people don't know how the proton actually looks in a density profile. And exactly these measurements I just showed you will give you this density profile, and you can make a big step in understanding where you see these long range correlations in other reactions. So now that was a proton we can do, I told you already also a lot on the nucleus. And here, one of the things is that we really want to understand the pattern distributions inside the nucleus as well as in the proton. Here you see actually one of these uh, uh, pattern distributions for the gluon with respect to the proton, how well we know how gluons are distributed in a lead nucleus compared to the proton. And the gray band actually shows you the uncertainty on this. So basically you can say the uncertainty is 100%, you know very little. And the EIC can actually really make a big difference on this by measuring the, uh, the cross-section, as I showed you before, as it was done for HERA, also in EIC for a heavy nuclei, same thing with F2 and FL. And if you do this, you get this really precise measurement of this cross-section. You take this and extract your pattern distributions from this. And here I show you actually the gluon one. The gray band, which you see here, is what I showed you as the gray band before. 
And then you have here the uh, kind of uh, lines they show you how the uncertainty band is after the no, after the EIC measurements are integrated and fully analyzed for the gluon distribution. So after an EIC, we will really understand the gluon distribution in the lead very well. Now, I showed you the pattern distribution functions, which you see here. I told you that we are completely dominated uh, by gluons already very, very early as function of X, so by 0.3. And the question is, how much actually can this gluon distribution rise? So is a proton or a nucleus something like a runaway popcorn machine where we produce gluons and gluons and gluons, or is there a process which actually really tames this uh, production of gluons. And it's basically like you put a lid on this popcorn machine and say, okay, now enough, no more uh, gluons or no more popcorns. So indeed, we can actually kind of study that in the EIC as well. So first of all, we can uh, look into how are the gluons in a lead nucleus uh, distributed. And for that, we do the same as for the proton. We look to shape psi production, which we can measure very well, which you see here. And then again, if we take the Fourier transform, we can reconstruct the source distribution, but we can do actually more. We can also look to if the nucleus breaks up, but the proton stays intact, and we look to this incoherent part here, which I show you. And actually what that gives you is not the source distribution like the Fourier transform, but it gives you actually how your source distribution is fluctuating on, the, uh, at, uh, on average around uh, the, the mean which you which you have, which is very important because some of this uh, kind of fluctuations of how the nucleus is looking like and the protons are distributed in elect nucleus has actually quite some implications on uh, understanding of heavy iron uh, kind of uh, observables. Now, last but not least on the physics program is really to see the state where we see saturation, I told you before, that is a state where we go from, that we produce more and more gluons into, that we have so many that they are sitting so close to each other that they are kind of recombining. And nucleus has the advantage that we get the highest, uh, do that in lead has the advantage of gold, that we get the highest uh, gluon densities. And uh, we can get such an enhancement of reaching the saturation regime, so the recombination regime, much earlier uh, by a factor of 200 compared uh, to gold. I'll go measurement five again. Yeah. Five minutes? Yeah, no problem. Uh, the measurement again is actually really easy. It's a counting experiment where we uh, count actually jets or dihadrons, which are back to back. So if you are not in a, a saturated regime, you get your electron proton electron ion collision and you get your die jets uh, back to back and you count them. If you have saturation, what happens is because you have this gluon wall, the backward jet actually basically disappears. And uh, if you count them, you get a suppression of uh, the number of uh, backward jets and this is what's shown here as function of square root s. At the highest square root s, you get a suppression in a factor of uh, two, actually, of the backward jets if you have uh, saturation. And if you have been following the archive, that is exactly what Star uh, just published. And we see uh, that these die jets are really disappearing. And we uh, kind of uh, see it exactly as it is predicted by uh, cis saturation models. So, you have the physics, of course, we have to measure this, and I will give you just a little bit about what we are thinking for the detector. So we have the different process of uh, physics topics, they are related with different physics uh, uh, measurements. So I already talked about inclusive DIS, where you look only to the scattered electron. Then you have semi-inclusive DIS, where you combine the scattered electron with looking to the hadronic final state. And then you have the measurements like DVCS and so on, where you image the proton or the nucleus, where uh, you have actually an exclusive reaction, you have to measure everything, and particularly this proton, which stays intact and goes under very small scattering angles. If you look to the uh, requirements on the machine and the detectors, they become more demanding going from left to right here, and so uh, the requirement for integrated luminosity to make the measurement. An EIC detector, if I half it basically, so here you have your collision electrons from the left, uh, right, 
uh, protons from the left, you collide. Uh, you have your beam line along here. So then actually what you can uh, see is in the hemisphere uh, of uh, angle going from zero to uh, 180 degrees that your electrons actually cover this side here from the outgoing electron into mid rapidity, so 90 degrees. And depending whether your hadrons come from a high X pattern or a low X one, they cover the full hemisphere. And that is actually then how you design your detector. You have a barrel and you have the uh, two end caps so that you can cover really all the particles in your uh, reaction. And for the exclusive reactions, you need uh, detectors very much along the beam line to capture the, small, uh, the particles scattered under small angles. And that is what you can see here. So that is actually the interaction region, the detector in the middle, a lot of detectors here along the beam line. And here you see a layout actually of the detector where you see that we have electromagnetic and hadronic calorimetry basically covering the full four pi region. The same for time uh, uh, particle ID. So we have rich detectors, time of flight covering minus four to four and then high resolution tracking detectors. So really to follow the particles very well. That then kind of uh, fulfills all the requirements of uh, tracking, high precision, low mass, uh, tracking, electromagnetic hadronic calorimetry, high performance PID. And uh, we will do a streaming data acquisition so that we have maximum flexibility and integrate AI and ML. And integration in the interaction region is absolutely all because we have only 50 centimeters between the detector and the first magnets of the uh, collider. Here, I give you a small summary of what technologies which we are thinking to use. The vertex detector is a new development of a CMOS uh, MAPS uh, tracker, which uh, is in synergy with what is done for Alice uh, CITS3. The central tracker will be gas detectors because as larger you become in radius, as more it becomes expensive to do that in silicon. Electron and hadron end cap trackers, the same technologies. Particle ID is driven by time of flight and Cherenkov detectors. Electromagnetic calorimetry, uh, we will use crystals because they give us the highest resolution in the electron going direction. And then we develop actually new um, technology, which is a scintillating class because it's more cost effective. Hadron calorimetry, we aim to get 50% of a square root E. So very large uh, uh, lead scintillator sandwich, which is longitudinal segmented. And the data acquisition I already mentioned is streaming so that we have really the highest flexibility. So in summary, so till now, we think we have really only seen the tip of the iceberg if it comes to understand the hadron structure and particularly the gluon, which dominates the hadron structure with the EIC, we hopefully get the full depth of the iceberg. Why can we do that all now? Because basically all stars align. We have the theory developments which allow us actually to answer these big questions. We have the detector technologies to build a detector which is as compact that it can fit into the interaction region. And we have the accelerator technologies which allow us to build a high luminosity electron proton ion collider. And without the EIC, you would absolutely not be able to answer all these questions. So therefore, as you are all in ahead of your career, let's get to work and build it. And I hope many of you will join us uh, in the endeavor to get the EIC built and get a job with us. Thank you. Thanks, Alka. Um, that was uh, that was great. It's a very, very uh, complete. Um, any questions for Elka? And you can ask everything, even where I was just at holidays lately also. If I was. Can I ask one question? Uh, yeah, who's, who's speaking? And uh, identify yourself and go ahead. Oh, thanks. Uh, thank you for the talks. Uh, I want to ask in terms of the field scaling, why with the emergence of grounds, then the structure function began to depend on the Q square? Because, you know, the, the process which uh, the glue, so at lower x, so low q square or even at higher q square, that is where you get the gluons. And then if you have more partons, you have more scattering centers. And that's why the cross section becomes larger. 
because that is exactly what the cross section measures. It measures how many scattering centers you have inside the protons and the scattering of particles which you scatter on are the quarks and the gluons. Okay, so it's still uh, scattered with, so we just regard the uh, protons as independent particles. Yes, exactly. You scatter on individual quarks and gluons. Okay, thank you. And of course, that only works if your wavelengths of the virtual photon mix you exchange has a resolution power that you can see them. That's why it is important to go to uh, uh, high energies so that you can do this. Okay, another question from Andre Cordero. Go ahead. I cannot hear you. Yeah, go ahead, Andre. Can't hear you. I'm not muted anymore, am I? Go no. ahead. Okay. Can hear you, yes. I'm sorry. Uh, thanks a lot for the very comprehensive talk. It was, it was very good. Uh, I wanted to, all, to ask about something that's uh, maybe more directly or especially relevant for the for the heavy ion community, which is constraints on uh, nuclear PDFs. So if yeah. you're planning on a, on a nucleus electron experiments and, and especially like W exchanges for the, for the C quarks. So if you could talk a little bit more about that. So... W exchange in the uh, EA is not something which is uh, really an option because for the W you need even higher square root S. Um, mm -hmm. That is possible for EP, but not for EA because for EA the machine is limited to a proton beam energy of 110. But I uh, think you don't need W. Uh, that is some nice uh, feature for uh, heavy I uh, for. Uh, PP or hadronic machines, we can do it actually with uh, charm, for example, where you tack on the gluon. You can do it with CDs, where you tack in the final states that you had a, a pion, a kaon, or a proton, like we do in the proton uh, as well. And then you use a fragmentation function to go back on which flavor you uh, have been tagging. Okay. Okay. Thank you. This is a, actually very good. Uh, yeah. And I. I have in the backup, I have some uh, plots also how well we can constrain uh, the different flavors. Okay. Thank you. That's very helpful. More questions for Elka? So let me ask one. So Elka, let me, I, let me characterize the physics you've talked about as sort of um, multi-particle QCD, spin, shadowing, all of that. But there's a whole other branch of QCD, if I may call it fundamental, running of alpha S. Uh, yeah. Universality. Um, what will EIC have to contribute in that sector? And do you have some idea of how that might make demands on the experiments that aren't yet taken? Yeah, into I, I do. So universality is not something which you can solve with one machine. Universality means that you need different machines and you need to measure the same observable or try to measure or extract the same observable like PDFs and do that with PP, EP, or uh, E plus E minus, of course, not for PDFs. And then C was uh, C PDFs you, uh, you extract are uh, universal. So actually the EIC uh, for the polarized program, the combination between EIC and the RIC is extremely uh, critical for this. So the whole TMD uh, program is uh, extremely critical. If we talk about, uh, for example, saturation, there it is also very critical that we see it in EA or EP, and then we see it also in PP and PA. And there, again, the combination between EIC, LHC, and RIC is very uh, critical. That's why the star measurement now is very critical to prove that we will see saturation also at the EIC. If you come to alpha S, alpha S, of course, is also something which is extracted from PDFs, the running of uh, alpha S. And EIC will, like HERA and so on, make contributions to this. But it's not a direct measurement. It is, is resulting from the measurements which you are doing uh, to kind of also then constrain the running of alpha S. So there is a lot of other things. EIC can measure quark couplings and so on, which, um, yeah, the, all the programming QCD can be basically addressed by EIC. Okay. Uh, thanks, Elka. I think uh, we're a little over time, but uh, that's the point of a, a workshop is to discuss. Thank you very much, Elka.